were looking at the incremental model of the uh, phase lock loops in the phase domain of course. So, what we have is the phase of the reference signal and you subtract the phase of the feedback signal from that and we have a gain of I C P by 2 pi to this we could have the charge pump noise added and in the present form of the loop filter we have the loop filter transfer function r plus 1 by sc to which we have the loop filter noise added and the vco <coughs> this is the phase noise of the vco which gets added at the output of the vco and in feedback we have an attenuation of 1 by n because we have a divider and we have the phase noise of the divider ok. This is fine and we saw that the loop gain was That's what the loop gain looks like. Okay. And if you plot the loop gain, this is what it is. This black stuff here is the proportional path. Okay, that is the voltage across R. That's what gives you this. It gives you a minus 20 dB per decade slope. And this one, the integral path, the voltage across the loop filter capacitor, that gives you one over s, s square. And you know that for a stable well behaved loop the zero frequency 1 by rc must be much smaller than the unity loop gain frequency must be smaller than the unity loop gain frequency ok. So, this part is quite similar to the CDR except that you have 1 by n in the expression for loop gain that is all. So, now we have to calculate phi out by phi ref and this will be the same as minus phi out by phi div right because after all phi div is added in the same place except with a negative sign right and it is also the same as the scale transfer function from i n c p right. all these transfer functions are the same. So, once you get this you have the rest of it also ok. So, what does this turn out to be? What will be phi out by phi ref? Do you calculate? Hmm? So, uh, what kind of transfer function will it be? What will be the order? Second order ok. Band pass now. It is low pass, but it will have a 0, right? Ok. So, what is the DC gain? N. Ok. And what is in the numerator? 1 plus S here. And in the denominator? have in the denominator uh -huh. plus 
square C n by I C P K V C okay. Okay. So, actually it is exactly I mean in the C D R what did we have phi out by phi n do you remember we do not have n of course, we have 1 plus S C R divided by 1 plus S C R the square C by I C P K V C O. Okay. Basically, this n comes in because we are doing the comparison at f f at a frequency lower than the output frequency, right. In a C D R, at least with let us say uh, alternating input data, you have uh, phase correction every cycle. In every cycle, you know what the phase difference is between the V C O s phase and the reference phase, and you apply correction in the loop. In this case, you have the correction only once in n cycles. Okay, so that's why we have this divided by n. Now this is also an approximate model because when you divide by n, you're not simply dividing the phase; you're also subsampling it. Okay, because the VCO can phase can be measured once in every VCO cycle. Okay, once you divide it by n, you can measure it only once in n cycles. That's like downsampling also. Okay, it's not just a attenuation of the phase. You cannot measure it once in uh, once every VCO cycle anymore because you don't have those cycles. You can only measure it once in n cycles. So, the downsampling comes into effect if uh, the bandwidth is large we can. So, for many of these things we use this approximate continuous time characterization assuming that all these phase uh, quantities are continuous time. We know that is not the case we can measure only phase only at discrete instance of time at 0 crossings of those waveforms and in case of uh, divider it not only attenuates it, but it also downsamples the uh, phase because now you can only measure it once every n cycles. Okay. So, anyway this looks the same except for also a DC gain of n. What is the meaning of this DC gain of n? Uh, yeah, why? <coughs> so, let us say the reference is like this. Okay. the feedback signal will also be aligned to it right in steady state. So, now let us say you step the this is like a step change in the reference phase right you move all the edges starting from some point. Now, what will happen is initially of course, there will be no change, but after some time this will get aligned with the new reference edges. So, basically the feedback waveform will be time shifted by the same amount as the reference waveform. Now, how does that happen? How do you shift the feedback waveform? The edges of these are time shifted compared to what they were initially there was some steady state. Okay. So, the edges are periodic at uh, T ref 1 over F ref and then because you step change the phase here this will eventually catch up and will become time aligned with the new one. So, all the edges are shifted compared to what they would have been okay. and how does the time shift here occur? What do you have what do you need for this time shift to happen? All the VCO edges also must be time shifted by the same amount. Okay. So, clearly the VCO edges will be time shifted by the same amount as the reference edges. So, that means that the phase in radians will be n times that of the reference. Okay. So, that is the idea. So, if you let us say apply a step change of 1 degree that is you have you have let the VCO uh, you have let the PLL reach steady state and then after that you delay all the edges by the same amount. So, the rest of it is still periodic with the same time, but only the one of the edges the first uh, one period will be bigger. Okay. So, you do it by 1 degree then let us say you have n of 50 then the VCO output will also be time shifted by the same time. Okay. So, that same time corresponds to 50 degree phase shift compared to what it was before. That is why you get that factor of n. Okay. So, you just have to interpret it correctly that is all. So, usually I find that uh, when you think about phase you think about the original steady state and then you either apply a step change or an impulse change. Step change is usually better because uh, it reaches steady state or over the new one. So, then you can interpret all this DC gain like things.
So this is a DC gain of n. So this also means that if uh, the reference has a low frequency phase noise, low frequency jitter, it will appear as a larger phase noise in the output, right. If you have phase noise whose so peak amplitude is 5 degrees, at the output it will be 250 degrees peak. And this uh, transfer function, the forms are the same, right? If uh, Z1 is the 0, in both cases it is like that, right? Uh, it is just that. Zero is, I mean, if you use the same notation for the components, they are at the same place, and the unity loop gain frequency is ICPR KVCO, and here it is ICPR KVCO divided by n. Okay, is this fine? So, what kind of? Uh, so, this is a second-order transfer function, but with a zero. So what will happen? What will be the, if I try to plot the magnitude of phi out by phi ref, what will that be? What will it look like? Yeah, it will have a peaking. I mean this type of transfer function will always have a peaking as you know from the uh, previous assignment because the coefficient of s is the same here and there and then you have a second order term this will always have peaking. So, it will be constant up to here and then it will have peaking and eventually it will go off like a first order roll off at that point. Okay. Now, this is excluding the gain factor of n. If you include the gain factor of n the whole thing will be lifted up and then you will have something like that, okay? because the DC gain is n, right. This has a DC gain n and it has peaking. It is mainly because of the 0. Okay. Now, a second order system can have peaking even without the 0, if the uh, quality factor is high, Okay, but here even if the quality factor is low, you will have some peaking, because you have the 0 term in the numerator Okay, and the peaking increases if Z 1 approaches omega u loop. That is, the 0 moves closer to the omega u loop, then you will have First of all, the quality factor itself increases, and then uh, you will have more and more peaking. Okay. This is fine. In this respect, uh, the CDR and this are similar, but we will make some modification to the loop filter because. Uh, the purpose of the synthesizer is slightly different. Okay. Any questions so far? And exactly the same transfer function appears for, uh, like I said, uh, the dividers phase noise as well as the charge pump noise. Okay, So, the low frequency noise of uh, either the phase noise of the divider or uh, the noise from the charge pump will go through the same thing and very high frequency noise will be attenuated Okay, that is basically what it says. right? Essentially just like in the CDR, if the reference is jittering very quickly, very rapidly, then uh, what happens is that 
the loop does not respond as quickly and uh, those uh, variations will get attenuated that is the meaning of the low pass transfer function right. If uh, the reference is jittering very rapidly then you will not have uh, you will not have I mean the loop will not have time to follow that ok. The one thing I have to uh, uh, mention I mentioned this uh, in passing earlier the whole thing is actually a hybrid like sample slash continuous time system because phase is sampled ok. Now, in this particular case the <coughs> uh, frequency at which the entire loop is updated is the reference frequency that is because only once in a reference cycle you have information about the phase and it will get updated ok. Now, we make all these continuous time approximations, but this assumes that within a reference cycle things should be changing slowly meaning although this expression says that where is that the closed loop bandwidth is approximately this right the unity loop gain frequency the closed loop bandwidth of this is approximately the unity loop gain frequency. Now, of course, you can just set any value to this, but that does not work like that this bandwidth has to be smaller than the reference frequency in fact, sufficiently small ok. Again uh, there are two things one is for the continuous time approximation to be valid this bandwidth has to be at most this bandwidth can be at most one tenth of the reference frequency after that this uh, effect of ignoring the sampling and treating everything as continuous time starts uh, coming into play and you will have different results whether you use the uh, actual discrete time uh, I mean discrete time uh, model with sampling or this continuous time model ok. So, that is one thing. Now, if you increase the bandwidth beyond that the loop will still work up to some extent, but only the model thing, modeling thing has to be more precise you have to take into account the discrete time stuff. But uh, you cannot have let us say a bandwidth more than the reference frequency I mean that is not possible because you are updating the loop only once in every reference cycle ok. So, there are fundamental theorems that show that the bandwidth has to be some uh, factor smaller than the reference frequency ok. So, we would not get into those details, but uh, in general the bandwidth typically actually the bandwidth will be much smaller than the reference frequency for other reasons right. Because uh, one of the purposes of this is to if the reference is jittery you want to clean it up. So, for that you should use a very low bandwidth uh, loop. So, that the output does not follow the reference jitter ok. But these are some fundamental limitations because of uh, sampling the modeling this continuous time modeling becomes inaccurate if the bandwidth increases beyond f f by 10 and in any case you cannot increase the bandwidth beyond that and have the loop to be stable that is not even possible because that is because you are uh, measuring the error and updating the loop only once in every reference cycle ok. Any questions? Yeah, it will alias. Actually, this uh, flicker noise aliasing is a very tricky problem. If we assume that flicker noise spectral density is in fact 1 over f all the way to low frequencies, then any aliasing is a problem because you will get infinity if you keep adding. I mean, you know that this harmonic series 1 plus 1 by n and 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3, that thing does not actually converge, right? That will go off to infinity. So, if you sample flicker noise and it in fact has 1 over f spectral density all the way down to uh, 0 frequency, then this uh, I mean the sample stuff will have infinite spectral density. So, there is some basic modeling issue there in the flicker noise uh, business, but <coughs> otherwise no uh, <coughs> the VCO's phase noise will be like that 1 over f cube 1 over f square and there will be some 1 over white part also ok. And we can assume that this kind of model is true up to f v c o by 2 let us assume that we are uh, looking at phase noise only once in every v c o cycle then it is a sample system with a rate of uh, f v c o. So, uh, it has frequencies up to f v c o by 2. Now, when you divide it by 2 
you will come here and then it will get aliased. So, that is okay, this white noise part gets aliased. So, as long as uh, this 1 by n does not bring you here, I think you are fine. Okay. You should not come down to some very low values. Okay. So, this continuous time behavior or model valid if the bandwidth of the loop, this is omega u loop by 2 pi hertz is less than a tenth of f ref. Okay. And when I say large bandwidths here approaching f ref by 2 with the single loop cannot realize large bandwidths approaching f ref by 2 and have stability. Okay. This is okay. Which one? Yeah. No, no, there also the continuous time uh, modeling will be valid, will become invalid if uh, the bandwidth uh, like approaches the update rate divided by 10, but the update rate is now at the uh, input rate of the CDR, which is so high, there is almost no question of the bandwidth approaching that. Okay. So, the constraint remains the same, but you are not even likely to encounter that condition, the bandwidth will be uh, like much more. Because let us say you have a 10 gigabits per second, now you are talking about a 1 gigahertz bandwidth, I mean no CDR is designed with that bandwidth, maybe tens of megahertz is the highest so far. Any questions? Now, what is the transfer function phi out by phi VCO that is the transfer function from phase noise to the VCO's phase noise to the output. First of all, you can see that uh, what will be the very high frequency gain from here to there? 1, because the loop will basically go out of the picture and it becomes 1 and it will be a high pass stuff. So, be a high pass transfer function. So, you have S square C n divided by I C P K V C O. or in other words a square by z 1 omega u loop 1 plus s by z 1 1 plus s square by z 1 times omega u loop. This is a classic second order high pass shape okay. and exactly the same as in the CDR right. This is no different. And in the body plot what does that look like? What will happen? It has a 0 and a, a 
zero behavior like this, right? With the zero typically like well below the unity loop gain frequency. So this is the loop gain. So the transfer function from the VCO to the output will be okay. So this is mod phi out by phi VCO where this is the unity loop gain frequency and this is 0 frequency. Okay. So, here it is plus 20 dB per decade, here it is plus 40 dB per decade. Okay. Now, the VCO's phase noise we know, I mean if you look at only the phase noise from fundamental considerations, it will just be 1 by f square. Okay. Uh, but at low frequencies because of flicker noise, you will have 1 by f cube and at high frequencies, it will also have some thermal components that is a constant spectral density. Okay. So, the actual uh, spectral density of the VCO looks like this. This is minus 20, this is minus 30 and this is 0. Okay. Now, you have to multiply that with the frequency with this one to find the output phase noise. Okay. Now, you can see that at very low frequencies, the uh, phase noise of the VCO will be either uh, uh, 1 by f square or 1 by f cube, okay. but that will get completely suppressed by this part of it. Okay. What does that mean actually intuitively? Yeah, lower frequency analysis completely tracked and finally, whatever the VCO was doing, if left to itself, its average frequency will be exactly n times f ref, right, because the loop will eventually correct it. The average frequency cannot be different from n times f ref, average frequency of the VCO. It can be jittering around like anything, but it cannot be different from n times f ref, because at DC there is total following. Okay. Is this fine? So, this is what you would get if uh, you had like a perfectly clean reference, then the contribution of the VCO uh, to the output phase noise will cause it to have some phase noise. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> and you can calculate the transfer function from here to there. I won't do it. It'll be similar to before. It'll be some bandpass transfer function which you can uh, then evaluate, find the contribution of the resistor and so on. Okay. And just as before, the charge pump will have some contribution, resistor will have some contribution, the VCO will have some contribution. And depending on the context, you may want to minimize the overall contribution, or there may be some other constraints. Now, uh, one difference between the CDR and this is that in general, this uh, if you just say a phase lock loop, its output is output should be periodic, that is, it should be it should deviate from this periodic behavior as little as possible. Okay? So, the whole entire goal is to generate a periodic reference. So, you want to minimize the jitter at all costs, okay? whereas in a CDR, there is some incentive to follow the jitter of the input, here that may not be the case. Now, depending on what the input is, like how clean the input is. If you want to, sometimes you have a jittery reference, okay. Uh, you have some reference, you know its average frequency, but it is not very clean, that is every period is not exactly the same. So, you can use a phase lock loop to clean it up, that is one possibility, okay. How would you choose the bandwidth in that case? That is, let us say you have a kind of dirty reference, you know that its average frequency is okay, but uh, it is not very clean uh, in that its uh, phase noise is high. Okay, so what should you do? How do you, how would you choose the loop parameters, loop bandwidth? You should choose as small a loop bandwidth as possible. Okay, that is, if your goal is to get a clean uh, periodic signal, starting from a signal whose average frequency is accurate but uh, it has a lot of phase noise, you should use as low noise an oscillator as possible. 
so that it does not generate its own noise and then you should choose as low bandwidth as possible. Essentially, it will completely filter out the phase noise of the reference. So, that is one possibility. The other way other uh, I mean the counterpart is you have a VCO that is noisy I mean for instance maybe a ring VCO and you have a reference that is clean. You want to use a noisy VCO, but the clean up its uh, phase noise to the extent possible then you want to widen the bandwidth as much as possible ok. So, these are the trade offs that may be there ok. <coughs> is this fine? Sometimes in large systems what happens is you do not know where the reference is coming from. I mean I said that a crystal oscillator can give you a very clean reference, but even then I mean the your reference may not be directly coming from the crystal oscillator. You have a large system and the crystal oscillator feeds some other PLL and that PLL goes through something and who knows I mean it may go through some digital blocks. So, finally, the reference you may be getting may be jittery. So, in that case you should choose a you will end up choosing a very low bandwidth and as clean a VCO as possible to get a clean clock for your block. Let us say your block needs a very clean clock that is what you will have to do. Yeah, so that is what I mean these kind of models cannot be extended all the way to infinity. Like I said you have to <coughs> uh, limit this to f v c o by 2 yeah ok it has to be like that. Actually the one of the reasons you get this white noise is that you have a v c o and you have buffers ok. Let us say you take the whole thing together then the buffer will have white noise and at every edge it will move the v c o edges by some amount. So, this will give you actually white jitter the phase noise itself will be white, but this is a sample process right. So, this is happening only at once every f v c o. So, this has to be taken only up to f v c o by 2. So, these things are not treated very cleanly and even I am not sure how to do this because it is usually done as a continuous time spectrum, but like you said uh, if you take continuous time spectrum going all the way to infinity it does not make any sense. But we also know by reasoning about it in the time domain that it is actually a sample process we are not talking about because the, the <coughs> phase change occurs only at the edges right. So, all these things are uh, valid only up to f v c o by 2 or maybe f v c o the if you take both the rising and falling edges of the v c o ok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that is why I mean in most cases you do not even model white noise and <laughs> you go with it so, ok. Yeah. Minus? 1 by f cube, 1 by f cube in power. So, that is uh, minus f cube. This is the 1 by f cube region of the phase noise, this is 1 by f square ok, but you are talking about the power spectral density ok. Any other questions? So, if you have a noisy reference use low bandwidth and a clean v c o to get a clean periodic output. And if you have a clean reference and a noisy v c o use a high bandwidth to get a clean periodic output ok. This is fine. So, as with any other uh, uh, noise optimization the way you do it is we know the basic principles the basic transfer functions what it looks like and so on. Then you resort to a simulator you see the individual contribution from different blocks and let us say I mean usual scenario is you design something and the noise comes out to be more than what you want and you have to see where to optimize. Obviously, you look at the different contributors Maybe the biggest contributor is the first one to target right and if that is too difficult or that is not possible then you go to the next one and next one and so on. So, all this analysis is to tell you like which way things go and then you can look at the actual contributions from different sources and see how to optimize ok.
any questions? One thing to be kept in mind is that the reference phase noise, the crystal oscillator's phase noise will be very low, but refer to its frequency. Now, when you have, a, especially when you have a PLL with a very large n, you are generating, I do not know, a gigahertz from a megahertz, you have n of 1000. So, that gets multiplied by a large number at low frequencies, right? It gets multiplied by n. So, that thing can start looking comparable to the VCO's phase noise, okay? because the reference uh, noise gets multiplied by n. So, that is one of the reasons why uh, if you want particularly low noise stuff, you should choose a crystal oscillator of as high a frequency as possible. Okay? I mean you should not choose like 1 megahertz and multiply it up to 1 gigahertz. Maybe if you could choose 100 megahertz crystal oscillator and multiply it by only a factor of 10, that will be good. Okay? So, you choose as high an FRF as possible if you have the freedom to do this. Sometimes it is not possible to pick your own FRF. So, this gives you small n and actually this goes a long way towards getting a lower noise system. Okay? And this makes sense, the higher the reference frequency, the more often you are correcting the uh, feedback loop, right? And more often you are activating the feedback loop to correct the phase of the VCO. So, this is better. <coughs> okay. Yeah, so you can see meaning uh, this also depends on what kind of jitter is important. Is it period jitter, is it the overall accumulated jitter and so on over some time, but I mean in general the VZO's phase noise I will show it as only 1 by f square. Okay, This is the phase noise of the VCO. and maybe the references uh, phase noise is much lower at the reference frequency right and let's say the zero is here and the unity loop gain frequency is there okay then what happens is that this uh, phase noise of the vco that's what will come out Okay, when the phase noise of the VCO gets multiplied by the high pass transfer function and this is what you will get. And the phase noise of the reference will get multiplied by first of all n, I mean 20 log n and then may have some peaking and after that it drops off rapidly. Okay. So, it is the sum of these two that you have to minimize. So, you have to pick the bandwidth based on that. Okay. So, yeah you should have a clean VCO, but uh, for a given VCO if you go on lowering the bandwidth the reference contribution will certainly become smaller and smaller, but the VCO's contribution should will become bigger. So, you have to also choose the bandwidth properly. So, especially for large n, the reference contribution can be significant, right. <coughs> so, this happens in uh, many other cases also, you know that the timing reference is from the CCM atomic clock. So, that I actually, I mean I do not know anything about them, but somebody who works with them told me that it has a highly accurate average frequency, but its phase noise is terrible. So, I think it is some quantum process which has lots of jitter and so on. So, you use that and you use that to phase lock a very clean oscillator, maybe a crystal oscillator or something. So, that uh, you have both the <coughs> long term stuff that is the average frequency is correct as well as the uh, like phase noise is small because you use a low phase noise VCO. So, you have to use that highly accurate reference 
with a low bandwidth PLL which has a clean VCO to get a clean noise. Uh, what was your question? Was that the question or? Uh, you can't do much. <laughs> Basically, you can't do much. Okay. If the teacher is bad and the student is bad, what can you do? <laughs> Oh, no, no, yeah, I mean still you need to define the average frequency, right? I mean the VCO will oscillate at some frequency, it will keep drifting with temperature and so on. So, the PLL will stabilize all of that, it gives you an accurate frequency which is independent of temperature etcetera because the crystal has that property, okay. So, that part is still there because you cannot, if you want a 2.4 gigahertz oscillation, you cannot hope to make a VCO or set its control voltage to some value and get 2.4 gigahertz, that is not possible because uh, uh, it will just drift all over the place. People are trying to do that for some other application that uh, these are low frequency oscillators. So, now there is lot of interest IOT is the buzzword uh, one of the latest buzzwords and there one of the things is to have these devices which uh, periodically turn on pull something or maybe transmit and then uh, uh, go to sleep. Okay, at a very low power. So, the idea is you are they either work from harvested energy or even if what they work from a battery, you have a small battery that you never replace in its lifetime. Okay, so, the energy consumption has to be very small and one of the make ways of making energy consumption small is you put it in standby and make sure that the leakage and all the other standby power is small that is very uh, crucial. So, then it wakes up once in a while, it will uh, absorb, it will use a lot of energy at that time, but because it is waking up only once a day maybe the average energy is very small. Now, for this to work one of the important things is uh, timing accuracy because uh, this has to wake up at the same time as something else wakes up let us say it is receiver or maybe some other IOT devices and so on. All these have to be running somewhat synchronously okay. If this wakes up now and then there is no response then it has to wake up again. So, then it will again uh, uh, you lose the advantage of this uh, standby mode okay. But on the other hand, you cannot use a full fledged crystal oscillator here that is uh, too power hungry and things like that. And on top of it, a crystal oscillator has a very high Q, and any high Q oscillator takes a long time to start up also. Okay. I mean, you know that a high Q system you apply energy and it will take a long time to build up. Okay. After that, it will also stay for a long time, but it will take a long time to build up that also you do not want. So, people are trying to make RC oscillators with appropriate components, some temperature compensation, all kinds of sophisticated stuff. So, that it has sufficient accuracy by itself, you do not need a crystal oscillator. This accuracy will not match the accuracy of the crystal oscillator, but uh, uh, it is still accurate enough for these purposes. So, there people are trying to do it. So, that essentially it is like the other scenario like I said, uh, you make the oscillator and it oscillates at some frequency. Okay. But that is still not good enough for defining let us say the frequency of a radio or free of a data rate of a transmission system and so on. But yeah, if somebody makes a device which is let us say different or cheaper or maybe can be made on a silicon IC, a device that will define the frequency very accurately, but will not have some of the disadvantages of the crystal whatever that is right. So, uh, first of all crystal is outside, if you can make the same thing on an IC that will be good or you, if you can make it at higher frequencies because crystal at most can go to 100 megahertz or so. So, if you can make a gigahertz reference on an IC which is also very accurate that will be good. Now, we looked at this uh, we have uh, we have evaluated the transfer functions and if we are given phase noise and this random noise from uh, the charge pump noise as well as the resistor noise we can evaluate the total phase noise. Okay, but there are also some systematic uh, errors in the whole thing. That is systematic deviations from periodicity. Where do you think that comes from? Yeah. So uh, one thing is we have assumed that uh, uh, the charge from currents are perfectly matched. Okay. That is, if both the up and down uh, signals are on, then the current to the charge from the current output of the charge pump is still 0. Okay. But if the currents are mismatched and they will be clearly in fact, this is a PMOS source and that is an NMOS source there is no uh, reasonable expectation of matching. Even if they were a both NMOS there would be some mismatch right. So, 
if both up and down are on this current will not be zero okay it will be equal to the mismatch current between the current sources so what is the consequence of this you understand the issue the two sources in the charge pump are not matched to each other so when the up and down uh, switches are both on the output current of the charge pump is not zero so what's the consequence of this which one what will the output be that's correct but what will the what else will happen to the steady state of the phase lock loop i mean do we have first of all a scenario when up and down are both on when yeah so we had to introduce a reset delay so that the phase detector works properly at all so during that time up and down will be on but uh, the I, earlier we assumed that it's injecting no current into the charge pump right so the phase detector characteristic had no error at all but now it is injecting some current into the loop filter so what happens now let's say the upper upper current source is higher than the has a higher value than the lower current source okay so every time up and down or on there is some current pushed into the loop filter i mean can it reach steady state like this uh, what when is the steady state of the whole thing when does the whole system reach steady state there has to be a steady state phase error meaning <coughs> because if these two are phase aligned right and the upper current is higher than the lower current it means that in every cycle when up and down are simultaneously high there is a current that is flowing in this direction but how can that be because if that's the case then this voltage will go on rising right in every cycle maybe by a little bit but it will go on rising so that can't be the case so what should happen so uh, if the upper one is higher than the lower one then there should be a phase offset between the reference and feedback such that initially down is on first down turns on so a current flows in this direction for a small period and then both up and down turn high and current flows in that direction such that the average is zero the average current going into the loop filter has to be zero right so <coughs> this means that basically which way will it lock will the reference be leading the feedback signal or lagging the feedback signal in this case if the upper current is higher than the lower current reference will be leading the yeah. reference will be leading the uh, feedback signal so the feedback signal reference will be lagging the feedback signal the reference will be lagging the feedback signal so the feedback signal appears first gives a down pulse so that current is drawn from the loop filter and then a current goes into the loop filter okay I hope the discussion is clear. I'm just straight away drawing the waveforms. So, in this case, what happens is, if you look at up and down, up will be up to this point, down will go high, then up will go high, and both will come down. I've shown a very long reset delay, just uh, deliberately. okay so the current going out of the charge pump would be in this period be minus i not whatever the current source value is and during the reset period it will be delta i right whatever is the difference current between up and down i mean upper and lower current sources and 
this is delta i. So, this average will be 0. Okay. That has to be the case, I mean because the loop filter has infinite impedance at D c, the average has to be 0. Okay. Now, you can see that the smaller the value of delta i, the smaller the phase offset, Okay, because the area under this red part here becomes smaller if our delta i is smaller and this also has to become smaller and it also becomes smaller if the reset delay becomes smaller. So, this is another reason why you should not go crazy with the reset delay. Okay, You should choose it large enough so that the phase detector works properly without dead zones and so on, but not so large that it unnecessarily causes extra uh, this one. So, what is the consequence of this now? Okay, yeah, ICP is like this. So, what happens? So, this is now a signal at FRF, right, because this interval is 1 by FRF. So, essentially into the loop filter you have a periodic signal at FRF. So, that will create a control voltage which is also periodic at FRF. So, which modulates the VCO. So, the VCO it will not have a single impulse at uh, even with no random noise in anything it will not be an impulse at n times FRF, but it will have side bands at plus minus integer multiples of FRF. So, we will discuss that and the solution to that one. Okay. Please think about this though, this happens when you have both reset delay and mismatch, but of course, these are not unrealistic cases both you will have. Okay. You need to have reset delay to make the phase detector work properly and then you will have mismatch because there are two different components that is all. Okay.